Good morning again. My name is Eric. I'm the pastor here. If you are a guest today, if you're visiting with us, I just want to say uh, a quick welcome and thanks for being a part of our church family here this morning. I would love to, uh, to meet you. Uh, we are doing uh, baptisms at the end of our service, but uh, if you are a visitor or a guest and you're patient, uh, I will have to get changed after that, but I would love to meet you out at the information booth uh, following the service. And if I don't get a chance to meet you today because of the time frame and because of all that, uh, I would love to meet with you at some point in the future. So thanks for being a part of our service today. At this time, the ushers are going to kind of make their way forward, and we have note cards for you today, little like index cards. And I'm going to just ask that everybody grab one and just hold on to it throughout the service. We're going to have you write down something on that card at the end of the service. And ushers, in case, I'm not sure if you're aware, but if a few of you can be available at the end of service uh, to collect those, that would be wonderful as well. I'm not sure if you were aware of that, but we'll need to collect them somehow. So at the end of service, as people are exiting, you can turn those note cards into them there. Well, uh, I just want to take a couple of minutes to, to, to acknowledge uh, what is coming up in the next couple of weeks here. Uh, here at Cornerstone, we typically, almost all of our messages are a part of a series uh, because we find that when we group those ideas together for a, a particular topic or a theme, that it helps us with retention and it, gets, it builds some momentum for some things. So next week, we are starting a new sermon series called Chase the Lion. And I'm really excited about this sermon series that's coming up. Uh, in the next couple of weeks here. In fact, if you're on the Bible app, if you are uh, logged in, you can find sermon notes. There, there's a link there because this sermon series, Chase the Lion, is based off of a book. Uh, there's a book named uh, Chase the Lion. Uh, I, I did my ministry internship with a guy named Mark Batterson, and Mark Batterson is the pastor of National Community Church out in Washington, D.C. Uh, some of you are familiar with some of his other books. He's got a book He's got several books. Uh, Circle Maker is one of his books. All In is one of his books. And his latest book is called Chase the Lion. And it's all about chasing our dreams. Uh, essentially, there is a passage of scripture in Second Chronicles about a man named Benaiah. And we don't know much about Benaiah, but we are told that Benaiah chased a lion into a pit on a snowy day and he killed it. And so what we're going to be talking about over the next several weeks is about chasing the 500-pound dreams uh, that are in front of us, or the challenges. You know, when you are face-to-face with a lion in a pit on a snowy day, some of you might say, that's a problem. But for others, they see it as a possibility and an opportunity. And I believe that there are dreams and plans that God has put in your heart that I believe that we want to chase and go after. So this is a great sermon series for you to be a part of. I think you'll be challenged for the new year. Pick up that book. I'm telling you, like the, the writer, the author, Mark Batterson, he, he could write bumper stickers. So like you're going to get a highlight workout. You're going to have to go through like four or five highlights if, you, if, you, if you're highlighting. It's a great book. I want to encourage you to, to pick that up. Well, today we are talking about vision. We're calling today Vision Sunday. And when you talk about vision... Everybody has an idea about what vision means. Uh, business leaders talk about vision. Uh, politicians talk about vision. Here we are in the church talking about vision today. Vision is one of those words and concepts that everybody likes to talk about because we like vision. We need vision. We want it. We want to follow visionary leaders and visionary organizations. And, and when people think about vision, a lot of times they are focusing on only on the what ifs. A lot of times when people talk about vision, they're looking to the future at some thing that we hope for that will happen in an organization or in your life. We want a vision or a better path for the future. Now, vision does include the what ifs, but vision also includes the what is, the, the present situation, because vision is about seeing. It's about seeing and understanding the what is and seeing and understanding the what-ifs as well. So for us to look to the future, we have to have a good idea of who we are and what we're doing and what we're all about. And so today, well, that's what we want to do. We want to take some time to talk about who we are as a church, 
what we're all about, why we do some of the things that we do around here. We want to understand the what is, and then we want to dream a little bit about the what ifs and the future and what God is calling us to do. Now, normally there is a banner behind me, and on that banner it says, love God and love others. Again, we, we took it down so that you could actually see the baptisms taking place. That's kind of the point. Uh, but uh, that banner says, love God, love others. And that is our mission here at Cornerstone. That's our purpose. Everything that we do is filtered through those four words. Now, you might say, Pastor Eric, where did you come up? Like, those are nice words, but where'd you get those words? Why is that our mission? Why is that our purpose? We find our mission in the words of Jesus. Look at Matthew chapter 22, verses 34 through 36 with me. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Now, this expert in the law is is putting Jesus to the test. This is not really a sincere question. He's not really going to Jesus saying, Jesus, I'm really interested. I don't know. I'd like for you to tell me what the greatest command is. He's testing Jesus. He wants to see what Jesus' credentials are. He wants to see what kind of level of understanding or what Jesus' teaching is going to be all about. So he asks him, what's the most important commandment in the law? Now, it's really interesting to me that when you read through the Gospels and you look at the life of Jesus, uh, most of the time, and he's asked a lot of questions, a lot of people ask Jesus a lot of questions, and most of the time, Jesus doesn't answer directly. I don't know if you've ever recognized that, but usually Jesus will answer with another question of his own, almost all the time. There are a few points where he actually gives a really clear answer, and this is one of them. So when Jesus gives a very clear answer to a question, especially from someone who's testing him, it is really helpful and important for us to look at what he says. And we see this in verse 37. Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second commandment, the second greatest is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And then verse 40 says this, All of the law and the prophets hang on these two commands. So Jesus says the entire Old Testament, all of the law of Moses, all of the prophets that came after, everything that they teach all hang on love God, love others. You can organize everything in the Old Testament under the idea of loving God and loving others. Jesus, if you look on the screen here, you'll notice there's quotation marks. Jesus is quoting two Old Testament laws. Deuteronomy 6, 5, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And then Leviticus 19, 8, love your neighbor as yourself. Love God and love others. It's pretty straightforward, isn't it? It's pretty clear uh, for us today. So what I want to do for the rest of our time together and our service together today is I want to talk about how we accomplish this mission. I want to talk about the process that we have to be able to accomplish this. The way as a church We try to encourage all of you to love God and love others. You you might call this our strategy. Now, a business doesn't just go and say, we want to be the best business and not have a strategy. You have to have a plan, right? Um, Some of you know that I've been doing some, some training over the last few months. I've been working out at a local gym and it's Shinobi Fitness over in, in Cottage Hills. And, and the owner is here. I don't know if I should embarrass him or not. Um, but, uh, but I had a competition yesterday. And uh, I, was, I did not do as well as I had hoped. I realized that my strategy was lacking, right? I realized, okay, I got to get, get on the uh, elliptical or run a little bit more. I got to work on my cardio a little bit because I was winded a lot faster than I thought I would be. Um, and so my strategy, I got to look at my strategy. How am I going to be better at these competitions and this training that I'm doing, right? So you don't just say, oh, I want to go be good at something, and then you don't have any strategy. So we as a church have a strategy. And the, the strategy that we have, not only does our mission come from the scriptures, but our strategy comes from the scriptures as well. You can find it in the book of Acts chapter 2. Now, This is smaller text. I know some of you are maybe not able to read this as easily as we typically have on the screen, but I wanted to put this all up here. I'm going to read this, but this is the strategy that the first or the early church took. This is the, the Acts records the the life of the first church, the early church, and this says what they did, and we find our strategy here. It says this, 
they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes, ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Let's not forget that last sentence. This is the result of them following this strategy. So what we've done prayerfully as we've looked at this passage, we've come up with four different actions that the early church did that we as a church want to do to be able to see more people added to the kingdom of God. And so there are four words that we use. As I say them, you may not know them off the top of your head, but as I say them, hopefully they're familiar to you. Hopefully you've seen them around the building and in our newsletters and in emails and letters that we send out. The first is celebrate. We find this in verse 46. Right at the beginning it says, they gathered daily together at the temple courts. So one of the things that the early church did is they regularly gathered for worship. They celebrated uh, what God was doing in their lives and they worshiped God together. This is a regular meeting and it was corporate. In the second part of that verse, we saw that they connected. It says they met in homes and they shared meals with one another. So they built relationships with each other. They spent time uh, eating with one another and encouraging one another, giving to one another. They were, they were celebrating, worshiping together, but they were also connecting and building relationships. Third, in verse 42, we see that they devoted themselves to the disciples' teaching, to breaking of bread or communion and to prayer. So the early believers, they understood that they needed to grow in their faith. They needed to understand more about who God was. And so they submitted to the disciples' teaching. They learned from them And they had spiritual disciplines that they took part in. They prayed, they had communion together, and they did these things on a regular basis. The last one was serve. They sold property and possessions and gave to those in need. Now, now if you read this, we're not going to go build a commune and force everybody to sell their stuff, okay? We're not doing that because if you look at this, this was all something they did willingly, Like this was not an organized thing. They just, oh, somebody's in need. I got an extra field. I'll sell it and I'm going to give the money to help that person. They served one another. They lived sacrificially and selflessly. So here at Cornerstone, based on what we've found here in Acts chapter two, there are four actions that we encourage the people of our church to take part in. Celebrate, connect, grow, and serve. These are our four steps or who we are as a church. Now, I know that life is built busy. You, you're running around in a million different places in a million different ways. Um, I mentioned I had a competition yesterday. My wife was super mom and super wife yesterday. because She was bouncing back and forth. She was helping out over there. And then she had to get Kent to basketball and back. And my son Parker had, had soccer. And she was just running. So my family, we understand what it means to be busy. You know what I mean? Right? You all know what it means to be busy. But help me out. Are you, are you there? Are you, anybody busy in the room today? Yes? Get, get, get some amen. See, now you're amening. Come on. Amen, pastor. I'm busy, right? So here at the church, you know, I don't want, the purpose of the church isn't just to fill your calendar with more things. That's not my goal, but my goal is to try to find a biblical model for what we're supposed to do and encourage you to do those four things in one way or another. Celebrate, connect, grow, serve. So here at Cornerstone, that's our mission, love God, love others, and we accomplish it through these four steps. And so what I want to do is for, the, for the next couple minutes is go through these four steps a little bit more uh, specifically. Celebrate. Uh, this is one of the things that we do here, and uh, we have a phrase that we say. In fact, it's on the banners out in the foyer. We say this, we gather together to celebrate what God is already doing in our lives. This is kind of our, like our, our, a theme that we say or a, a phrase that we say when we talk about celebrating together. Because it is very important that you are a part of the life of a church on the weekend in our services. Now, it's essential, I would say, for you to be a part of worship service with, services with us, but it's not because going to church earns you a gold star or a badge or points to get you into heaven. I think there's some people that think, well, you got to go to church, otherwise, you know, God might smite you. No, it's, that's not the purpose of going to church, is to earn your way up. It's not like there's a, a ladder system that you have to earn points. Going to church isn't just about getting fed. 
Uh, There are a lot of people, unfortunately, who come to church uh, once a week and they have this expectation that the pastor will feed them for the week. Now, I I hope that when I speak and when we we, we meet together, I hope that you're, you're fed. I hope that you're encouraged and you're built up. But if you're only eating spiritually one meal a week from 1010 to 1130 on a Sunday morning, uh, you're not going to get the spiritual nourishment that you need. Just like your physical body would not be healthy if you only ate one meal in a week in the same way spiritually. Uh, So the purpose of coming to church is not just to get fed. The purpose of coming here is to celebrate and to worship and to encourage what, what one another here in this place. We want to celebrate what we say, what God is already doing in our lives. So here's the point. We don't come here to get the victory. We live in victory throughout the week because we've been saved by God's grace and empowered by the Holy Spirit to live for him. So when we come here, we just rejoice and say, hey, this week I I lived in victory. I lived in God's strength. The Holy Spirit empowered me. I had this great conversation. Or man, I was starting to get down, but I read my scriptures and I prayed and God built me up again. And we come here, we celebrate the fact of what God is doing in our life. We encourage one another. Hebrews puts it this way. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. We want to hold unswervingly to the hope that we profess. This is a statement of strength and faith. He's not saying, let's hope that what we profess doesn't swerve. No, this is a statement of we're going to hold to what God has promised us. And the way we do that is by spurring one another on, encouraging one another. So when you come here, even if you're having a great week, you need to be at church. Why? Because somebody will be here on the weekend who isn't having a great week, and they need to be encouraged by you. Because there's going to be a time when you're going to be having a rough week and you're going to need some encouragement and you need that person that's been having that great week as well. We come here to celebrate what God is doing in our lives and to encourage one another. Second, we connect. The phrase we use around here for this is, is we build encouraging and authentic relationships that make us better people. You know, I want a relationship and a friendship with somebody that's going to make me a better person. Not just somebody that I can go hang out with or worse, make me not a better person. Do you know what I'm saying? We, I want the kind of relationships that will encourage me and make me better. Church, we need each other. In Genesis chapter 2, God said it is not good for man to be alone. Now, he, wasn't, he was talking about Adam, but he was talking about mankind in general. We need each other. John Don in his famous poem Uh, He said, no man is an island, entire of himself. You know, there are some people who try to just live as an island and isolate themselves from everybody else. But I'm telling you, we need each other. Proverbs puts it this way. As iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. Look, I'm not interested in just a social club around here. I'm really not. We can go down to McDonald's uh, any morning. There, McDonald's is packed on, a, on, on any given weekday. You can go down there and make friends and just kind of have casual relationships, right? You can go to a coffee shop. You can go all these other places. Here at Cornerstone, we need to develop the kinds of relationships that sharpen one another. Now, this is a challenge, right? This doesn't feel good all the time. If, when you sharpen iron, there's friction, right? And stuff gets, it gets, gets, gets rubbed off, and there are times... That, that happens in our relationships. But church, I need people who will look at me and say, look, man, you've got a bad attitude right now. <laughs> look, right now, br- my, I need to have somebody in my life who says to me, look, Pastor Eric, you know, this is an area of your life. What's, what's going on here? I'm seeing something in your life that isn't in, all, in alignment with the scriptures. I need that. I'm a pastor. I know you need that as well. We need to v- invite people in and have open and honest relationships with other people. There are some people in my life that I will call from time to time when I've got a situation that I'm walking through, a couple friends in particular, and they will say to me, Eric, you're being a knucklehead. Look, you got a bad attitude, and you need to let, you need to let, knock that off. So I don't like calling them, but I do, because I need, but I do anyway, right? I do anyway. Look, do you have somebody like that in your life? You know, here at Cornerstone, we hope to create environments where you can build those relationships. It takes time. It doesn't happen instantly. But I'm telling you, it's worth the investment. So we have things like life groups. We have things like interest-based groups. You heard it in the announcement video. Hearts at Home is coming up. And we have a game night coming up. 
Now, you're probably not going to go to the game night, meet somebody new for the first time, and you say, hey, what sins are you struggling with, right? You know, like, that's probably not going to happen. But you might meet somebody who four months down the road, six months down the road, you could sit down with a cup of coffee and say, look, I've been struggling the last couple of weeks. Can you pray for me? Do, do you have anybody like that in your life? We want to create environments where you can discover those kinds of relationships. So I want to encourage you to get involved in a group. Pastor Kermit helps us with this area. He's going to be out at the information booth. And if you just say, look, I want to get connected in some way, find him and help us uh, help you get connected here at the church. Third is grow. So we celebrate, connect, and then grow. Grow is when we say we discover who God is and what he does so we can know who we are and what we're called to do. So when we know who God is, it tells us something about who we are or rather who we're not, right? That we're not God. And then when we see who God is and we discover, or what he does rather, when we discover what he does, it helps us to see what we should do. We want to be like him. We want to follow his commands. So if we're going to love God and love others, we, we, we got to know who this God is that we're talking about loving. And how do we do that? By studying God's word, by discovering who he is in the pages of the scriptures. Second Timothy 3 says, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching. That's nice. Rebuking, yeah, that's hard, right? Correcting, we don't like that either. Training in righteousness. But why do we do this? So that the servant of God, all of us, the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. We don't want to just study the Bible so we can have some answer, right? We don't want to study the Bible so we can be smarter than someone else. We want to study God's word to be equipped to accomplish the work that he's given to us. So we have Sunday school at 9 o'clock. And we have Cornerstone University on Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. And these are designed to help you grow in your faith. We have practical classes that will help you in practical aspects of your life. And we have theological classes that will help you grow in your knowledge of the scriptures. So Sunday school, we've got uh, Betty's Sunday school class that meets back here. We've got another adult Sunday school class that meets upstairs at 9. We've got a prayer class that meets also Uh, On Wednesday nights, uh, this current series in our Wednesday night, Cornerstone U, is a health and wellness class, very practical, uh, to start out your year by Darla Brown. Uh, We've got a class called Guarding Our Hearts by Gary Payne. Gary Payne, I love the man. He is, he will, he's like, he is like drinking from a fire hose, okay? So if you're going to go to that class, I mean, get ready, because he will Fill your, you, he'll fill your brain. He is an incredible teacher. Uh, he actually does some preaching on the side uh, for our district, so he's not here today, but he is an incredible teacher, and you will be filled with knowledge uh, in, in going to that class. And the last one is a class on resolutions and habits by Pastor Phil. And I'm going to tell on you. I don't, he, didn't, he didn't know I was going to do this. But Pastor Phil's like, why did I decide to do this class? He said, because I'm horrible at this. <laughs> and so I said, that's a great class for you to learn and grow and share what you're growing and learning in. So health and wellness, guarding our hearts, resolution habits. Some practical things, some ways to expand your understanding of who God is and what he does. So we celebrate, connect, grow, and finally we serve. We say it this way. We give all that we have and all that we are because Jesus gave everything for us. Church, this is what we've got to be all about. It, when we come here, it can't just be about my wants and my needs. It's got to be about me serving the needs of others and giving to others. Now, I believe that Cornerstone Church is the best when we give ourselves away. Over the last couple years, we have done some incredible things by, that are sacrificial and serving and giving. And I think we do excel in a lot of ways in this area. Every year we put on a fireworks event for our community. That is incredible. It takes a lot of money and manpower and volunteer hours, and you, you do an amazing job at that. Uh, we started a camp for foster care kids this past year, and uh, we're, gonna, we're, we're, we're gearing up to do another camp this year. Um, we, we, we do... Um, a couple years ago, we raised money to help purchase a van for the Thayers that has handicapped uh, accessibility for the wheelchair for Nathaniel. I mean, and we raised, I, I, I shouldn't say this, but when the ladies came to me and told me what they wanted to raise, I was like, okay. <laughs> what was it? Was it 10000 that you wanted to raise? 10000 I was like, all right. Um, well, we, we can try. <laughs> we raised $14,000. Because you gave all that you have and because of what Christ has done for you. So we do well at this, church, but we've got to continue in this. And we've got to serve. We've got to give of ourselves. This past week, uh, we had a funeral here at the church. 
And I met with a couple of the people in our church that were helping at that meal. Vanita Anderson isn't here. She actually had someone pass in her family, and she's not here today. Uh, But Vanita Anderson has been coordinating our funeral meals. And I sat down with her for a few minutes, and she's been serving faithfully. Uh, And the go-aways, you you might know the go-aways, they helped out. They help out with our—are they here? I don't know if they're here. There There they are, right there, the go-aways. I was talking with them, too, about Wednesday night meals. They've been doing Wednesday night meals for years and years and years. And you know what? In talking with them, they were so satisfied and fulfilled in the ministry that they've been able to do in providing meals on Wednesday nights for the last several years. Look, when you give yourself away, when you spend yourself in ministry, you will never be spent. When you spend yourself in ministry, you will never be spent. When you serve, when you love others in that way, you you will get blessings back of fulfillment and joy and contentment that you never thought possible. And in talking with Vanita, she she, she loves the ability to be able to go serve these people who are in mourning and who are grieving. So I'm telling you, church, let's find ways to serve and give. Martin Luther King Jr. said it this way. He said, everybody can be great because everybody can serve. Everybody can serve, whether it's big or small. Ephesians 4 says, it was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. This is, I'm just going to be straightforward with you today. My job as the pastor is not to do all the ministry of the church. Pastor Phil's job, Pastor Kermit, Pastor Chris, our job is not to do all of the ministry. Our job is to, uh, is to train people, to prepare people, God's people, for works of service. Our job is to prepare and equip you to do the ministry. That's our job, and that's our role and our responsibility. Why? Because when we all are a part of this, and when we are all doing this, he says that's when we are all built up. That is when we all reach unity in the faith. That's when we all become mature or we become like Christ. So we provide a whole host of ways that you can get involved here at the church. Ushering, greeting, Wednesday night meals. There's a need for help in there. Uh, once a month to help in Wednesday night meals. Funeral meals. Maybe, maybe you can't help um, very, uh, regularly. and Funeral meals are great because they're not on a regular basis, you know what I'm saying? And you might be available for that during the day, especially if you're retired. Maybe you can help us go by purchasing the, the meal for it. Our Royal Family Kids Camp for foster care kids is coming up. Can you serve in that area? Ushers and greeters. We have needs in our kids' ministry. Can you help once a month in our kids' ministry? Or maybe for one session in Cornerstone University. There's all sorts of ways. And you can even get involved in ministry outside of the church. There's other organizations as well. So these four steps, I'm going to put this on the screen here. These four steps are also really our process. Because what happens here at the church is, for the most part, when people come to Cornerstone, they start where? On our Sunday morning service, don't they? They start there, and and they, they celebrate with us, they worship with us, they get kind of acclimated to us. And our hope is, is that people move from celebrating to connecting, Our hope is is that once people have been here, they begin to develop relationships with people here in the church through through a connection group or a life group of some sort. And then from there, they begin to say, I want to take some ownership of my faith and I want to grow in my faith. I want to start going to maybe Sunday school or Cornerstone University. And they begin to grow. And then from there, they begin to serve and they find a ministry team. So there's a process. So today, where are you at on the process here? Is there a way that you can move from celebrating to growing, or or celebrating to connecting, rather, uh, connecting to growing, and then growing to serving? You know, church, I believe that when we do this, we can be just like the early church that added to its number daily. Look, I hope that uh, today, as we've talked about these different ideas, that you you see that not only are we trying to take a biblical approach in how how we do church here, but I want to encourage you to be a part of the process here because it's, it's nice to say, oh yeah, we love God and love others and then just not do anything. But I don't want to be that kind of church. I don't want to be the kind of church that just talks. I want to be the kind of church that celebrates all that God's doing in our lives. I want to be a church that connects with you. You know, I can't personally connect with every single one of you, but there's smaller ways and small groups that you can connect with one another. Uh, I want to grow in my faith. Uh, you know, I, I, I want to study, I want to I learn more about who God is, but I also want to serve. 
You know, as a pastor, I serve, but I want to find ways outside of my job responsibilities to serve as well. Now, I want to end today by asking you to write something on that card that we handed to you. And this is where I want to dream a little bit today. So if you can take that card and hold it in your hand for just a moment. A year ago or so, we did something similar to this, but I want to, be, I want to do this again, but I want to do it really specifically. I want you to look at that card, and I want you to think about, and you don't have to fill it out this minute, but sometime between now and before you walk out the door, I want you to, to write down the name of someone on that card. Because there is somebody that you know that you can invite. Now, I want to keep this very specific. There are a lot of people that you know that don't know Christ, that are not Christians, they're far from God, and we want to pray for those people, but this is, this is specifically for what I want you to do is write down the name of the person, the one person that you're going to reach out and invite specifically to Cornerstone Church this year. That specifically you're going to invite into this process this year. Who is the person? Now, if you're a guest and you're, you know, you're visiting from out of town, you don't have to fill that out. Or if you're newer here and you're not really sure what this, you know, how this all works, that's fine. I'm, I'm not going to force everybody to, to fill this out. But if you're a regular part of the church, my, please hear my, my heart for you as, as your pastor. I believe that part of this process is, not, is great. Wow, that's the church. The church does that. You know what the church is? The church is not a building. The church is you and I. It's all of us. In the scriptures, there's a word that's translated church. It's ecclesia. And you know what that church is used for? It's not used for buildings. It's used for gatherings of people. Like a riot could be an ex- ecclesia if you were translating something from back in, the, in, in those days. So the idea is it's a gathering of people. And so you are the church. And so if you're going to be part of Cornerstone Church, can I just ask that this be your mission and your strategy as well? That you would take this a part of your life and say, I want to emulate that in my life. And there's somebody, a friend, a family member that I'm going to invite into this this process here at Cornerstone Church. Because why? Because we want to add to the number daily those who are being saved. Look, please hear me on this. I am not interested in just numbers. I'm interested in people finding Jesus and experiencing the love that I know most of us in this room have experienced. And if we've really experienced that love, if, if you know, one of the phrases we'll say sometimes is you are loved, you know, we, we are, if we are really loved by God, shouldn't we then turn our love back to him? When somebody does an act of kindness to you that is out of the ordinary or unexpected or extreme, don't you just want to love that person back or do something kind back to them? If God sent his son to die for us on our behalf. And if we truly have experienced his love, don't we want to love God and love others? And so who can you love by inviting them into the process this year? So if you've got that name already, you can write it down. I would like to ask you to keep it to one, um, you know, just for the sake of being succinct. I know some of you have probably written 15 names down already. But I want, I want, it, I want a, a measurable goal that all of us can achieve. And I want, we're going to pray for it this week at the week of prayer. This week is our week of prayer. I want to encourage you to be a part uh, tonight at 6, the rest of the week, Friday through, or Monday through Friday at 7 o'clock to 8. It'll be an hour long. We're going to have some worship. We're going to have some prayer. We're going to pray for these names. We're going to be in prayer throughout the year for the names that you write down. We're going to take this very seriously. And so um, I want to encourage you to just, I'm taking a moment here because this is really important to me because I want you, I want to invite you into the mission. I want to invite you into the process. What would it be like if that person entered into this process and came to know Jesus? That's what I want you to think about over the next few minutes. The worship team's going to come and I'm going to pray. Lord, today we give this service to you. God, we want to be the kind of people that love you and love others. And we want to celebrate all that you're doing. We want to grow in our relationship with you. And uh, we want to connect with others and we want to serve. Lord, I pray that you would help us to accomplish this. This vision, this mission, this purpose that you've given to us. And Lord, I don't know who it is I don't know who the names are yet at this point, but Lord, as people prayerfully consider who it is that they need to invite into this process, God, I pray, Lord, that you would give them favor to have conversations, give them clarity to know who the person is that they need to write down. Help us, we pray, in Jesus' name, amen. You know, some of you, you might say, Pastor Rick, I don't know anybody to write down. And I want you to hold onto that card, and I want you to keep it in front of you, and I want you to intentionally, over the next week or two or three or four, find someone that you can write down their name. Let's make this a real important part of our mission here and what we're accomplishing at the church here. I'm going to ask our prayer team to come forward. Every week, we give opportunity for people to respond 
to the message. And uh, our worship team is going to lead us in prayer. Uh, I'm going to slip out with a couple of people who are getting baptized today. I'm so excited. You need to hang out to the end of the service because we're going to baptize a couple people. And baptism is always a great time uh, for us here at the church. If you have a need today, If you have something on your heart, maybe you just want to take that card and you want to kneel at the stairs here and pray about that person or pray what person it is that you're going to write down their name of. Uh, Or maybe you want to do that prayerfully in your seat. You can do that as well. But let's just take some time today and let's respond. Let's worship God. Let's consider how we can be a part of this process, how we can love him more and how we can love others more. And uh, let's give ourselves to him today. Would you stand with me as the worship team leads us? And if you are getting baptized, if you could meet me down in the office doors, you can leave, uh, slip out the side there and I will open the doors for you in just a second. Thanks. Matt, would you lead us?